while I did not ask Jonathan to lead that song, that's quite a beautiful song, and I'm certainly glad he led it. It has nothing to do with the sermon, but I always enjoy singing that song and hearing it as we worship God by use of that song. In the book of Genesis, chapter 14, we're introduced to, I would say, a mysterious figure. Now, the first 11 verses of that chapter, we note a list of kings. And these kings, we see, would wage war and eventually overtake the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. By doing so, they would also capture Lot. They would take along with him his family and even his possessions. We see this in verse 12 of that chapter. And in verse 13, we see that an escapee would eventually tell Abram, later known as Abraham, of this account. Now at that point, in verse 14, we find Abraham gathering 318 of his trained servants and arming them to go rescue his nephew Lot and his family. We see that they were successful in defeating these kings and their servants. And in so doing, Abram was able to rescue Lot, retrieve all of his possessions and his family. During their return, Abram and party are met by the man of our study at this time. So in Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20, we read, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And he gave them tithes of all. From this passage, we can note at least four things about Melchizedek. As we read, he was the king of Salem. He was a priest of the Most High God. We find that he blesses Abram. And we see that he received tithes paid by Abram. So we'd like to study this morning, who is this Melchizedek? What is his significance and how might it apply to us today as Christians? In Hebrews chapter 7 verses 1 through 3, we find a little bit more detail about who this man Melchizedek is. Verses 1 through 3 of Hebrews chapter 7 reads as follows. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now, we consider the characteristics as described by the writer of the Hebrews. It says he met with Abram and even blessed him. And he received 10% or tithes from Abraham, all those things which he possessed. Even his name and title, the word Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And his title as king of Salem means king of peace. His genealogy is referenced. The fact that he has no such genealogy. He has no birth mother mentioned or father. He has no descent, thus he has no children. Because of this, the way he's pictured in scripture, he has no beginning or end of life. Due to these characteristics, he was made like unto the Son of God. And he remains a priest continually. These are strange characteristics, no doubt. 
So just who was this man? Now many have submitted different theories as, the, as to the real identity of Melchizedek. Some think that he was an angel. Some think that he was Enoch. Some claim he was Shem, the son of Noah. Some say that he was the Holy Spirit. And some claim that he was a theophany, which is a pre-incarnate of the second person of the Godhead. We would refer to him as Jesus today, but that's what some people theorize. Now, I believe this was a man chosen by God for use in Scripture. I do not believe he was any of these individuals, these persons. While he remains a mysterious individual, we will develop this idea as we move forward in our study. Secondly, we consider his significance. Hebrews chapter 7, dropping down in that passage, verses 4 through 10. <clears throat> From this passage, we can note several things. It says, Now consider how great this man was, speaking of Melchizedek, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham, and blessed him, or blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when, he, when, when Melchizedek met him. We all would admit and agree that Abraham was a great man. In fact, to the Jewish mind, there was no greater place than to be in the bosom of Abraham after their physical death. But we see from this passage and even Genesis 14 that Abraham gave Melchizedek 10% of his possessions. This is just after he spoiled the kings who had captured Lot. As he did spoil those kings, he overtook them. This pattern would be seen later in Israel under the law of Moses. The priestly tribe of Levi would receive tithes from the other tribes. This would continue throughout the entirety of the law of Moses. The point here is that Melchizedek was superior to Abraham and by extension even superior than the Levites under the law of Moses. Then we see in verses 6 and 7 of the passage we just read that Abraham received a blessing. It says there, but he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had promises. So he had already received promises from God, yet the godly priest Melchizedek blessed him further. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Throughout the Old Testament, we can see that fathers would bless their children. They would bestow some sort of gift to their, their children, typically the oldest son. And this pattern would continue. The fathers would bless the children. The greater blesses the lesser. Even though Abraham was a recipient of many promises from God, he was still less than Melchizedek. This would further then solidify the fact that Abraham, though a great man, was still inferior to Melchizedek. We see also that his priesthood was not affected by death. Verse 8 again, And here men that die receiveth tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witness that he liveth. Under the old law system, the law of Moses, priests, no matter how godly they were in their service to God the Father, they would eventually die, and thus their priesthood along with it. Even under the law of patriarchy, 
those faithful priests would eventually die. And while they did receive tithes, they were still mortal men. As each of these priests died, their service to God would then end. Because of how Melchizedek is pictured, he lives, he continues to live, and he remains then a continuous priest. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3. Thus his service to God in this office still continues. Because he remains a priest, he is also then superior to even Levi and the, the priests from that tribe. And we'll develop this a little bit later on. And we see that Melchizedek received tithes from Levi, verses 9 and 10 of our passage. Though Levi was not even born, he paid them through Abraham. Again, further building on the fact that Melchizedek is superior to both Abraham and Levi. Now third, how is this going to help us as Christians? What application can we make from these, these concepts? Well, ultimately, Melchizedek points to Jesus Christ. We see that Melchizedek was the king of Salem. Now, there are many who say that this is the same geographical location of the later Jerusalem. Whether that is the case or not is really irrelevant. His title remains. He's still the king of Salem, king of peace. Now we compare him against Jesus. Jesus was given the title Prince of Peace or Lord or Master of Peace. This is foretold in Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Jesus was promised to come and he would take up that title, Prince of Peace. He was also promised or he promised others that he would build his church. Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He was successful in building that church. We find from Acts chapter 2, verse 47, that there were souls added to this church on that first Pentecost after his resurrection. Throughout the gospel accounts, there are references to a coming kingdom. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17 Mark chapter 1 verse 15, Luke chapter 21 verse 31. Jesus said that some who were present at the time he spoke those things, some would not die until they saw the kingdom of God come. Matthew chapter 16 verse 28, Mark chapter 9 verse 1, and Luke chapter 9 verse 27. This matters because the church is the kingdom. The kingdom is the church. They're both the same entity. These different terms describe different aspects of the one institute that Jesus promised to build and was successful in building. Jesus then established his kingdom. And he is its king. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 21 through 23. Which reads... Jesus being far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. It is impossible for one to have dominion and power without having some type of authority, in this case, king. Jesus has all authority over the church, over his kingdom. We note also that he is not only the king or prince of peace, but he is also the giver of peace. 
quite a few scriptures here, so get your pencils ready, I guess, if you're writing notes. Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Galatians chapter 1, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. Philippians chapter 4, verse 27. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 16. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 14. And Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. In each of these passages, peace is referenced. And they're being offered to each of those recipients of these letters. But it only comes from God through Jesus Christ. That's how it's ordered in those passages. Clearly, from these scriptures, Jesus is also the king of peace, king of Salem. As we've read, Melchizedek was a priest of the Most High God. He was a priest of God under the law of patriarchy. Now today, there is a different high priest. In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10, a little bit of a lengthy passage, but it says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way? For that he himself also compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifice for sins. And no man taketh his honor unto himself, but he that is called, or he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Again, that's Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. We note that under the law of Moses, the high priest would offer sacrifices for himself and for the people. However, we have a high priest now that offered himself as the sacrifice, but not just a sacrifice, a perfect, sinless sacrifice for all of mankind to be also the sacrifice for others. He is after the likeness of Melchizedek, order of his priesthood, and that is Jesus of Nazareth. We know that he, Jesus came from the tribe of Judah and not from Levi. Thus, under the law of Moses, he would be disqualified for being a priest. However, the writer of Hebrews makes this point. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 11 through 14. If, therefore, per perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which the tribe or of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So again, Jesus would be disqualified for being a priest under the law of Moses. 
However, Scripture teaches that he is indeed our high priest. This is only possible if the law changed. Now, we're not talking about altering a law to fit circumstances. What we're describing is the fact that the law of Moses and even the law of patriarchy ceased to have any religious authority upon the world. Now, we are all subject to the law of Christ. And Jesus is our high priest. Now, each person who submits to the law of Christ also becomes a priest. Upon obeying the gospel of Christ, one becomes a lively stone, a part of a spiritual house, a precious or peculiar purchase, a member of a holy and royal priesthood. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. This is true of all faithful members of the church, Christians. As priests, we offer up spiritual sacrifices to God. This is all made possible by Jesus Christ. Now, as we've noted, Melchizedek appears to be immortal or eternal. As stated earlier, there are many theories as to who he was because of this. Many of these theories are disqualified because their genealogies are found in Scripture. Thus, they cannot be Shem or Enoch. Now, I believe that Melchizedek was simply a, a godly man. He was doing what God obligated him to do, and he faithfully discharged his obligation before God as priest. And I believe the Holy Spirit chose this man on those accounts, and his life was re recorded in just the right way to be a type of Jesus Christ, to be a type of Savior, to be the example that would help us learn different aspects of Jesus. He had no parents, he had no children, at least listed by Scripture, and his death is not recorded. Now, the new high priest, which we've referenced, Jesus Christ, would also need to possess these qualities. Now, we know Jesus took on the form of flesh, but we're talking about before that. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 15 and through 17, says, And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus would perfectly fit this description. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There was... The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. You drop down to verse 14 of that chapter, and you know, you can read that this speaks of Jesus. He is known as the Word, the eternal Word. And though he was physically put to death, he was raised from the dead by the power of God. Acts chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Acts chapter 4, verse 10. And Romans chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. As well as 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Jesus had no beginning, nor does he have an ending. That's why he's able to proclaim that I am Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Because of this, there is no ending to his priesthood. And this should give each and every one of us hope because our priest cannot be put to death. Our priest cannot die. Now this morning we've studied just how great, though not in depth, but how great a man Melchizedek was. 
His greatness was seen to be superior than that of Abraham and even the priests under the law of Moses, that is, Levi. He was selected in Scripture to foretell one who would later come to be high priest. This person would be a priest and king and would possess the same type of greatness and superiority as did Melchizedek. We know this person to be the second person of the Godhead, Jesus the Christ. He possesses another attribute, though, and that is prophet. And this sets him apart from all others. He possesses all three of these, priest, prophet, and king. For no other man, we know from reading the gospel accounts, that Jesus taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. Jesus brought God's will to mankind. In Hebrews chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, it says there, For this is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before, for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. This new law that Jesus brought allows us to draw unto God from a personal standpoint. We don't need someone to worship on behalf of us, to tell us what the scriptures say. We can do that on an individual basis, and we're expected to. Now lastly, consider Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 16. It says, But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of bulls or the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a test uh, testament, testament is there must also of necessity be the death of the testator Jesus our high priest brought us the perfect will of God referenced in scripture as the perfect law of liberty and thus by his death brought about salvation not only under the law of Christ but to those who were faithful in each of their respective laws the law of patriarchy and the law of Moses his cleansing blood flowed backwards, if you will. If they were faithful to God under their law, the blood of Christ covers them as well. Jesus, our Lord, prophet, priest, and king, endured physical death in order to establish his kingdom, the church, the body of the saved, and thereby instituting his will as law for mankind. And that law is what we'll be judged by in the last day. In that death, he shed his precious blood. And that precious blood has the power to wash away all of our sins. One who has faith, has repented of past sin, publicly confessed their belief in Christ as the Son of God, and is ultimately baptized for the mission of sins, contacts that saving blood of Christ. And upon doing so, that individual is added to the church, that body of the saved, by the Lord. Now, remaining faithful to that doctrine of Christ is required if you wish to become eligible to receive the word of heaven, the promise of eternal inheritance. That offer is always made available, but at this time we wish to offer the invitation for those who are not a Christian at this time. If you wish to become one, you know what you need to do in order to become one. Take the next few moments to become a Christian. Yet if you are already a child of God, yet you've let things slip, you've allowed sin into your life, make things right before your creator. 
Whichever of these apply to you, please make it known as together we stand and sing. <laughs> 